Welcome everyone to the first webinar of the University of the Sunshine Coast Research Unmasked Seminar Series. I'm Dr Gemma Reid and I've been part of the organising committee for this series. The aim of the series is to provide information about research relating to COVID-19 from our academics at USC. There are five webinars in total in the series and they cover a range of topics from today's session on physical and mental health to vaccines, designing and creating COVID safe environments, business resilience and the wider societal implications of the pandemic. Before we go on with tonight's session, I'd like to, on behalf of all the, all the speakers today, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and waters upon which the university's campuses are located. I acknowledge their continuing connections to country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I recognise that these lands have always been places of learning and teaching for Indigenous peoples. In a moment, I'll be handing you over to our session facilitator, Professor Jim Logopoulos. Before I do, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about how the session will run today. So first, we'll be taking questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. You should be able to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you can use this to type in your questions. You won't see the questions coming through during the session, but you will see them come through as they're being answered. You can also select the option to ask your question anonymously if you'd prefer to. Secondly, you may hear an audible tone during the session while the speakers are presenting. We're just using this to keep our speakers to time so that we have enough time at the end for questions. Now, it's my pleasure to hand you over to our session facilitator, Professor Jim Logopoulos. Jim, if you'd like to come onto video now while I, just while I introduce you. So, Jim is the director of the Sunshine Coast Mind and Neuroscience Thompson Institute. Jim's research programs are focused on youth mental health, healthy brain ageing and dementia, PTSD and traumatic brain injury. He's published more than 200 peer-reviewed articles in some of the highest ranking interna international journals and he's the editor-in-chief of the journal Frontiers in Science. Jim is often invited to run neuroimaging workshops both nationally and internationally and he's forged collaborations with international laboratories including at Harvard and Yale. So I'll just hand you over to Jim now to take us forward with the session. Thanks Jim. Thanks, Gemma, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Research Unmasked, which is designed to showcase some of USC's finest research. Now, normally I'd be standing up in front of everyone in a more traditional setting and one that we've all become accustomed to. However, as we all know, the world in the midst of COVID <clears throat> is a very different, is very different. And of course, in this event, uh, we're coming to you live. I mention this because all of the researchers that we're going to hear from today are indeed joining us from their respective locations. And so there'll be a little bit of juggling of technology. So please bear with us if we experience any technical difficulties. Now, as Gemma just mentioned, the focus of tonight's session is on physical and mental health. And it's been designed to help showcase some of the best research we're doing here at USC and particularly how it relates to COVID. The topics we'll be discussing tonight are particularly pertinent, especially given the impact uh, that COVID has placed on us as individuals, as families, and of course, as part of our community. Now, our esteemed researchers, who I'll introduce shortly, will present some of the cutting edge research they're working on. Now, each of the speakers tonight only have 10 minutes to give you a flavour of their work. And so, I'd encourage everyone to view this session as an introduction to their work and to dive deeper into the respective topics outside of this session, if need be. Now, I'm confident that I speak for all of the presenters tonight, that they'd welcome the opportunity to discuss their work in greater detail outside of this forum, if need be. And indeed, if we have, uh, if we have questions that we don't get around to tonight, um, we can um, find a way where we can uh, get the, answer, the questions answered and disseminated. As I said, uh, at the end of the last speaker tonight, there'll be an opportunity to ask those burning questions and thus I encourage people to send their questions through and we'll try and answer as many of these as possible. Let me welcome you all again to tonight's session. I hope that you find the research presented tonight informative and the ensuring discussion stimulating and thought provoking. Now, without any further delay, it's my pleasure uh, uh, to introduce our first speaker to you tonight, and that is Dr. Rachel Sharman. Rachel is a senior lecturer and researcher in the field of psychology. Thank you, Rachel. 
with a focus on, chi on child and adolescent development. Rachel frequent, frequently represents USC via public speaking engagements at national and international conferences, as well as in schools and community groups. Now, for those people who think Rachel looks familiar, it's probably because you've seen her throughout the media. Rachel is regularly through, uh, seen on media, including newspapers, magazines, including Time magazine, no less, as well as local, national and international radio and television. Now, tonight, Rachel will give us an overview of healthy and unhealthy coping strategies. Thanks, Rachel. Good evening, everyone. Now, let's do our first little bit of technology, shall we? I'll share my screen. Let's hope this all works. Someone yell at me if it's not working, that'd be great. All right, um, I'm just really going to do a bit of a, a sort of a, a stress and coping 101, um, if, if you like. So it's, it's nothing amazing, um, but it's just a bit of background. So when the researchers are talking about some of their latest stuff, hopefully this gives you some context of this, the sort of things that they're talking about and the sort of issues that they're trying to, uh, to deal with and understand better and, and hopefully give people some ideas on how they can better manage themselves in these difficult times. So look, when we talk about stress from a psychological point of view, what we're really talking about is our reaction to a situation. So of course, this is our reaction. Um, we can all encounter a situation and some people might view that as a very stressful event. Other people might view it as a challenge. Some people might even actually enjoy it, horror of horrors. So it's, it's, a, it's remarkable the way that we have individual differences in how we deal with stress so-called stresses in our environment. But the idea is we encounter something, we have a stimulus. Chances are we're going to pay attention to certain aspects and we may even ignore others. So we might, you know, maximise and minimise certain things that are pertinent to us um, personally. We will then interpret aspects of that situation and we'll come to a sort of a conclusion in our own mind of can I cope? So if I had a snake drop on me right now, I would probably appraise that as a threat and I don't think I'd be able to cope very well. However, if I was an expert snake charmer or snake catcher, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. I might be a little bit surprised, but I wouldn't get particularly stressed or fearful about it. So that's the sort of individual things I'm talking about. So we're going to experience an emotional reaction. For most of it's, us, it'll be fight or flight. So our adrenaline will start pumping, our heart rate will go up, and we will then start to you know, wish to flee the room and of course feel fearful or stressed or you know, somewhat challenged in a way that we weren't um, expecting. Now, there's two major ways that we tend to deal with stress and, and most researchers sort of lump these into two different categories. We then sort of split them out into other categories when we get really specific, but I'm just gonna talk about the two general ways of dealing with stress tonight. So the first one is what we call problem focused. And this is quite simple. It's changing the situation. So whatever the actual stimulus is, whatever the problem is, we actually try and change that problem. So we really go after the cause. What is causing the stress? I'm gonna change the cause. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of, or I'm gonna somehow alter the problem so it's no longer a major deal for me. Again, we come up with this, is it a threat or is it a challenge sort of idea? And that will come back to your perceived control. How much control do I genuinely have over this situation? Just some interesting research. Um, controlling some aspect of the situation can make people feel better. So let's say you lose your job. You might not be able to get that back, but what you can do is conduct yourself in a way to actually go and find a new job ASAP. You can start writing out resumes, looking at speak straight away, you know, not sort of sitting in front of the TV eating a bag of chips. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, even thinking you have control when in fact you don't can improve performance. So that's really, um, that's really interesting. We, we know from um, pain studies in particular that when people believe they have some level of control, that actually helps them perform better and feel better in those situations. Some uh, little tricks of the trade, you can use tips such as visualisation. Um, I think it's Baroness Susan Greenfield has done some wonderful work in this, um, in this area, looking at how imagination, actually just visualising the steps that you need to take can really motivate you and in fact help the sort of the, the pathways in your brain strengthen so you know what steps to take and when you go to take them, you're actually better at them. By the way, athletes use this a lot. So when you see those um, men about to kick a goal in the rugby and you can see sometimes the funny eye movements, they're actually imagining the goal being kicked correctly. They're hoping to activate the correct pathways in their brain so they actually get that ball through the goal. So there's, there's some real science behind this, which is quite interesting. 
Another little uh, concept that I'm quite a fan of is something we call psychological inoculation. So this is idea, uh, the idea that you try and get yourself exposure to milder versions of the stress. Now, we haven't really had a mild pandemic recently, so we probably haven't had a great, uh, uh, a great deal of experience in that. But this is why we sort of, in psychology, and myself particularly, because my, my real area is developmental psychology, so child psychology in, uh, in particular, but this is why we warn against sort of the helicopter parent always buzzing in and solving problems for kids instead of letting themselves work Work through those problems, failing, learning from that failure, figuring out what to do, learning how to solve problems. It's actually really important that we let kids do that. It helps, um, it helps teach them not only how to manage their stress, but the fact that they've got the resources and the wherewithal and the cognitive ability to work their way through those problems. So really important, we don't always sort of buzz in and rescue our kids. They need to fall over, they need to scrape a knee, they need to fail because failure is in fact a learning experience and it's a really important one. There's a whole other lecture in that that I give quite frequently and often. Okay, the second dominant one that we're probably all uh, familiar with, the, the way of dealing with stress, and we're all guilty of. So, you know, I'm not trying to sort of be judgmental here. I've fallen into this trap. We've all fallen into this trap. What we call emotion focused. So rather than solving the problem that's causing the stress, all we try and do is just change the negative emotion we're having. So we're feeling flustered, we're feeling frightened, we're feeling maybe a little bit depressed and sad or angry even. And what we try to do is change that emotion. So we try and stuff that emotion down. And we can use that, we can do that using drugs, alcohol, food, all of the sort of things that we, we typically, you know, might turn to when we're feeling really, you know, rotten about life, the old sort of bucket of ice cream and the, and the glass of wine. Now, look, there's nothing wrong with that in small amounts on occasions, but the problem we get there is after you've gone and sort of stuffed yourself full of chocolate ice cream and wine, uh, you wake up the next morning with a hangover, a kilo heavier, and you've still got the same problem. Okay, so it doesn't actually teach you anything. It doesn't actually help you solve the problem and you don't learn anything. You're exactly in the same spot that you were in the first place. Um, something that we need to really think about is what we call the anxiety avoidance loop. So you get anxious. <laughs> Okay, something really awful's happened. It's terrible, okay? And you don't want to face it. You don't want to actually tackle the problem. You want to stick your head in the sand and hope that it all kind of washes over you. Chances are that's not going to happen, let's be honest. So what we do is we actually avoid the problem. We go, oh, I'm, just, I'm not dealing with that now. Hey, we often talk to students about this in terms of procrastination. They've got a big essay due, they're anxious about it. So what do you all do? You decide to go and clean the oven or practice the piano or, you know, wash the curtain rods or, you know, <laughs> anything you can possibly do to not approach that task. And of course, two hours later, two days later, that task is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but what happens in the moment? So you have this anxiety. Oh, I've got to do this essay. I've got to do this essay. Oh, I, I, I'll go and do the washing and I'll do the gardening and I'll, I'll, I'll iron everything in my cupboard. Um, and in that moment, you feel a sense of relief. It's sort of, oh, I'll go and do something else and I'll be fine. And then slowly but surely, because that, that, that looming deadline of the essay, it's still there, sitting there, sort of tantalising you and, and torturing you a little bit. Um, the anxiety starts to build slowly and slowly again. But to feel better, what do you do again? You avoid it. You procrastinate. You avoid it again just to get that temporary relief. <sighs> so it's that sort of up, down, okay? What you're actually doing there is you're reinforcing or rewarding avoidance and you're not actually going towards that task. You're not approaching it, you're not dealing with it, and you're constantly rewarding avoidance strategies because just for that moment, just for that hour or two while you're madly ironing or gardening or whatever, you feel better. I'm distracted, I'm not thinking about it, I'm not worried about the essay, I'm put that over there, I'm gonna worry about that later. That's great, but it doesn't get the job done and it still comes back to bite you over and over again. 
So look, it's a very easy loop to get into. People who actually suffer from anxiety, uh, you know, a great deal really um, use this strategy far too much and they, they wind themselves up into all sorts of knots about this and they end up reinforcing their own disorder. They end up reinforcing their own anxiety by avoiding the thing that they want to avoid. The best thing you can do bit of stress inoculation, bit of problem solving, approach that task and tackle it. Get it out of the way and get it out of your life. And so you don't need to worry about it anymore. And more than that, you're not feeling that anxiety loop. Okay, um, the special case of exercise. Exercise officially is an actual avoidance technique, uh, an emotion focused technique. However, it's the one that comes with very few side effects, very few poor side effects. The side effects are all good. And I know Dan is going to wax lyrical about that in his talk. So if you have something that you absolutely cannot control, such as the death of a loved one, exercise is one way you can go. Here's some practical tips. What can you problem solve? What can't you problem solve? Approach the problem. If necessary, get help. Don't try and do it all on your own. Keep things in perspective and practice gratitude as well. So this is a, just an idea of a gratitude journal, something you can do to keep yourself up um, every day and keep yourself going. And if you do all that, hopefully you can manage your stress. That's me. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, Rachel. Um, what we'll do is we won't take any questions now. I know that there's some questions probably coming through uh, already. In the interests of time, we'll keep going and we'll keep all the questions right till the end. I must say, Rachel, uh, you had my attention when you talked about the snake falling from the roof. As I was leaving my garage today, there was a snake catcher removing a snake. And I can tell you, Queenslanders can be as blasé as they like about snakes, you know, amongst us. But someone who's only just recently up from New South Wales, i.e. I've been a Queenslander for five years, I haven't quite grasped the whole snake thing yet. So thanks for that analogy. It got my, uh, my adrenaline and my anxiety right up. Thanks. Our next presenter is Dr. Dan Wadsworth. Now, Dan is a lecturer in applied science in USC's School of Nursing, midwifery and paramedicine. He's also an active member of USC's Early Career Researchers Network. Now, having previously worked in New Zealand and the UK, Dan has developed a diverse research background in exercise physiology and best practice in tertiary health science education. Dan publishes regularly in both of these fields and he's rapidly developing an international reputation for his work. Dan is currently leading an Australian arm of the international study exploring how COVID-19 has impacted our physical activity levels and well-being, and he'll be speaking about this topic tonight. Dan, Dan's online. Over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and good evening, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen now. Um, so hopefully you can all see this and as Jim said I'm going to talk you through my research journey during the COVID process. Um, let me just uh, get things going. So a little bit of a background. I am in the School of Nursing. I'm not a nurse. I'm the science guy. My research is predominantly in the clinical exercise space. So the sort of thing you can see in this image here, I'm getting people more active, feeling better about themselves. There's always an underpinning concept of well-being in the work that I'm doing in the healthy aging physical activity field. Um, I now tag myself as being a reactive researcher because on the 4th of March, myself and colleagues were sat in a rest home in Maruchidor talking about um, delivering a study just like the one you saw that photo of. But by the 4th of April, obviously everything had changed and I was actually invited to lead this coronavirus restriction study for the Australian arm of this international project. Um, and the term unprecedented is the word that comes to mind, isn't it, when we talk about COVID-19 measures. Unprecedented measures, unprecedented rules and restrictions. Um, we know what they are. And here in um, Sunshine Coast and in Queensland, we can attest to the fact that these unprecedented measures have worked. They've helped reduce the spread of COVID-19 such that we're able to move as we are today compared to other countries and even other states. 
But this change in circumstances for almost everybody does come with other public health or potential public health implications. We know that physical activity is really important for, for example, for our vascular health, getting our heart better, for our respiratory function, even for our immune system. But as Rachel alluded to in her talk, it's also really important for our mental health and our mental well-being. So it's key that we actually do explore and look at how these restrictions you can see on the screen impact on the type and amount of activity that people are doing. And so we got together a team of 25 researchers led by a researcher in England called Dr. James Faulkner at Winchester University. Um, and these researchers spread across five countries and 16 institutions. They included myself, um, Dr. Mia Schoenberg and Associate Professor Chris Askew from here at USC. And we set about answering a couple of questions really with regards to the COVID restrictions and their impact on mental health and well-being and also their impact on the type and level of activity that people were doing at this time. To do so, we developed an online survey that kind of pulled together a few valid and reliable tools. So things like the IPAC is a very well-known questionnaire around physical activity, recalling what you did in the previous week, but also including some depression, anxiety, stress scales and the World Health Organization's measure of well-being. To give you a bit of an idea of a timeline of our study, well, this is the timeline of, to date, coronavirus. Our survey was open between April and May in the UK, Australia, New Zealand and Ireland. We're all coping with things at this time independently, aren't we? Um, and this period here is also when my in-laws were stuck with me from the UK. So I had extra things on top of that to cope with. So it was a welcome relief to throw myself into the research. Um, we are also doing follow-up surveys and looking at this data now and have further follow-ups um, in the pipeline for next year. We did a number of different analyses, looking at things like how was your activity pre versus during COVID restrictions. We were able to ask and quantify different types of activities, so amounts of moderate and vigorous activity, walking and sedentary, to come up with a number, which is a met per minute per week. So we could really see and compare levels between individuals and between time points. And we also had the arduous task of categorizing all the activity that people said they did. So if people told us that they did um, three times a week and ran twice a week, that all got coded. And we explored a number of things, including differences between ages, genders, locations, but also correlations between things like physical activity and mental health and well-being. We ended up having as you can see on the screen, over 10,000 respondents to our online survey, of which um, almost 8,500 gave us full, complete responses to the survey that we were able to use and include in our analysis. Now, you can get an idea of the typical respondents from our information here. Almost three quarters of them were female, an average age of 44, and a white ethnicity was by far the prominent ethnicity, which it's not surprising considering the countries in question. Now that doesn't of course mean that the other 25% of respondents were not well um, represented because that's still over 2000 people. And we saw age range of answers and survey respondents from 18 to 80 and a full range of ethnicities as well. Interestingly, three quarters of the people who did complete our survey reported meeting physical activity guidelines of 30 minutes of activity, on at least five days a week prior to COVID-19 restrictions. So we had quite an active bunch who responded to our survey. And what we found, well, actually this point is a little misleading because overall what we found is that there wasn't really any change in the amount of exercise or activity that people were doing from pre to during COVID-19. On an individual basis, we saw swings of positive or negative up to 32%. So some people were doing almost a third more, some people were doing a third less, but generally speaking, those two balanced themselves out and our overall numbers were, looked pretty similar between and during for the amount of activity that people were doing. There were some interesting trends within that though. So we saw a greater positive change in females. They were more likely to be the ones who were doing more activity during COVID-19. We saw larger negative changes in our youngest age range, the 18 to 29 year olds, they were some of the people who were 
most likely to see those reductions in their activity levels. And our neighbours across the Tasman in New Zealand best maintained those pre-COVID restriction exercise behaviours. So essentially speaking, if you're a young male that lived in the UK, Ireland or Australia, you had a higher chance that your activity level had dropped than perhaps if you were a female living in New Zealand. We also saw a very clear negative change in activity was associated with poorer mental health and well-being. And this is really important because um, the converse was also true. The longer you spent sedentary, the, wor the uh, worse your mental health and well-being was as well. And this ties in with what Rachel already told us, that exercise can be a good means to improve your mental health and your well-being. Down here in the Southern Hemisphere, we actually showed better levels of mental health and well-being, particularly New Zealand. They had a significantly higher level of mental health throughout the survey. Now, we saw some interesting behaviours and changes in the types of activity that people were doing. We saw quite significant reductions to complete reductions in things like team sports, like soccer, rugby, netball and the like but also sports where you needed access to amenities. So things like squash, tennis courts, um, golf courses, swimming pools, but even gym-based activities. And of course, those things that may also have required you to, um, or that you couldn't do because of social distancing, like dance. Dance came up quite a lot as something that people had stopped doing. Of course, we saw some activities that were increased as a result of the COVID restrictions, and they included the obvious things of people were walking more, people were running more. And that's not surprising when you consider that some of the restrictions in place in New Zealand, for example, allow people to exercise for one hour a day. So people were going to make most of that hour as a chance to leave their house. Um, but people were also more active in housework, in gardening, in DIY. And we saw a massive increase in the uptake of online classes. So things like online yoga, um, online high intensity activity, the good old aerobics and actually one name that came through quite a lot and that personifies this is Joe Wicks or the PE with Joe. We saw a number of people, particularly from the UK, but maybe something you're familiar with. Um, now, Joe is a PE teacher for primary school in England and he went completely viral. As you can see, he had almost a million viewers tune into one show every single day of the week. He did this um, little exercise program, which was predominantly aimed at school kids. The whole country generally got on board. And so what does it mean? Well, we found that first and foremost, our findings reinforced this positive impact of physical activity on mental health and well-being, particularly during such a stressful and changeable a time as COVID-19. So it's great to see that that association is so strong that it still happens. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, we saw that young adult males are perhaps most at risk of the detrimental effects from COVID restrictions on their activity, and then perhaps as a knock-on effect on their well-being. Importantly, the changes in activity type must be appropriate. And the reason that I flagged Joe Wicks to you is because my dad is 75. I would speak to him on Skype and him and his wife would say, we have to go now because we're going to do Joe's exercises. And exercises aimed at a six, seven year old primary school um, student are probably not the best activities that a 75 year old man um, could be doing and so exercise needs to be appropriate. We're suggesting that um, targeted interventions potentially looking at that young adult male group in particular may be something that needs to be considered when restrictions are returning as they are now in the UK and of course the other question for us is whether people are maintaining these new activity behaviours over time and so that's the point of our follow-up surveys as we continue on this journey through COVID-19 and through this research. And that is about me. Thanks, Dan. Thanks very much for that. Um, can I ask uh, people, if you've got questions, now's the time to start sending them through so we can collate them and start um, uh, sending them through to our, um, our speakers tonight. So if you've got any questions, uh, please start sending them through. Uh, Dan, that was uh, that was very interesting. Uh, I like the bit about your dad doing um, the uh, seven-year-old uh, exercise. That was great. That was great. 
So our final speaker today is another Dan, and I'm referring to Professor Daniel Hermans. Now, Dan is Professor of Youth Mental Health and Neurobiology and Deputy Director of the Thompson Institute. Hi, Dan. Dan's just come online. I've known Dan for many years now, and as such, I'm very familiar with the quality of his work, and I'm excited that he's actually talking tonight about some of the work he's engaged in and about some of the things that we do at the Thompson Institute. Now, some people don't know, but Dan is a cognitive psychophysiologist, and he can tell us a little bit about what that is, but he essentially studies brain development as well as psychiatric and substance use disorders in young people. Uh, Dan is actually leading the world, a world first study into adolescent brain development, which I hope he touches on tonight. If not, we can ask him some questions about it if he's too shy about that, but it really is a fascinating uh, study, and again, world's first study never been done anywhere else in the world and so uh, that is an exciting study and perhaps he'll tell us a little bit about it. Uh, Dan's published more than 180 peer-reviewed articles in some of the highest ranking journals on the planet and so that tells you something about his quality. Tonight Dan's going to provide an overview of some of his work hopefully as well as some of the programs that we're actually uh, doing or taking place here at the Thompson Institute. So Dan over to you. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go for it. Great. Sharing screen now. Uh, I'm going to assume that that is people can see that, uh, and I'm sure someone will let me know otherwise. Yeah, good evening. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Good evening to you all. I hope everyone is well. Uh, I've been really interested in the talk so far, so I'm going to continue things. I'm going to um, uh, elaborate on some of the things that Dan just mentioned. Uh, and, and talk about, um, you know, the relationship between mental health and physical health, uh, but in particular also uh, brain health uh, and in the context of COVID. So mental health and physical health are inextricably linked. They're, they're, they're very much interconnected and it can be difficult to have one without the other. Uh, often someone experiencing mental illness will also experience poor physical health and poor physical health can in turn be associated with poor mental health. So I've been looking at the, uh, the literature recently. It's amazing what has happened this year in, in research. It's been an amazing year. There's already a lot of studies uh, out there looking at um, things like uh, physical activity or exercise in the context of mental health during COVID. Uh, there were seven studies that uh, I was particularly interested in. They surveyed, and this is very consistent with what Dan's just presented, surveyed over a 13,000 adults across uh, six different countries and they asked them about their levels of physical activity during COVID restrictions and how this may relate to their uh, mental health and well-being. So in general, uh, these studies find that mental health problems have increased uh, substantially compared to, to pre-COVID levels. I guess that's no surprise. Uh, but strikingly, across all of these studies, the same patterns have emerged increased physical activity or exercise is associated with better mood and well-being. very much what Dan's just uh, showing you in the findings of their study. Uh, and, and on the flip side, uh, low levels of physical activity have had negative effects on psychological health. That is in particular increases in depressive and, and anxiety uh, related symptoms. Uh, so an area of my own interest, uh, youth uh, research, uh, very few studies have actually examined this in children and adolescents. Uh, I am aware of an unpublished uh, study from Australia, uh, was recently presented at a conference, uh, of uh, 760 adolescents. And these researchers found that around half, 48% of them had psychological distress levels that were indicative of probable mental illness. Now, the important thing about this is very high, but it's double the rate that we've known or we see uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, also, those who had or self-reported uh, a prior diagnosis of depression or anxiety, they had even greater uh, levels of psychological distress. They, they reported decreased exercise and poorer sleep during COVID. So more research really needs to be done in children and adolescents as they very much rely on play-based activity to meet developmental milestones. And in fact, they require exercise probably more so than adults. 
Furthermore, physical inactivity increases the risk for mental illness. We, we certainly know this, and this is particularly pronounced or more relevant in young people because the onset of these uh, disorders are primarily in that age range in adolescent and young adulthood. So what's the research about COVID, like Dan's work uh, and the studies I just presented, what are they telling us to date? Um, well, obviously um, there's recommendations now, very much strongly recommending that during these periods of lockdown or restriction, physical activity should be as vigorously promoted uh, as social distancing itself. Now, whether or not that has been achieved, I'm not sure, perhaps we can discuss that later. Now, as a brain researcher, I'm also interested in whether there are any brain studies, uh, and I couldn't find any that are published today, but there will be some soon, I'm sure, including some of our own from the Thompson Institute. So that is, there are no studies that I could find that have specifically looked at the effects of physical activity or exercise uh, on the brain in the context of COVID. However, I am now going to, um, to touch on, whoops, I'll just go back a slide. I'm just going to touch on um, what we do know already uh, in this area about the effects of physical activity on the brain. So firstly, uh, exercise promotes thinking skills. So that is our attention, memory, decision making. It's also known to improve mood. Uh, exercise has widespread effects on the brain. However, it seems to affect one part of the brain in particular and that is the hippocampus, which is deep inside of our brain. And this structure is responsible for our learning and memory. It keeps track of what we learn and experience from minute to minute. And it consolidates this uh, learning into long-term memory storage. Now, when brain cells or neurons are created, a process uh, called neurogenesis, the hippocampus gets larger and memory improves. On the other hand, or on the flip side, when neurons are damaged or destroyed, a process known as atrophy, the hippocampus shrinks and memory and learning is compromised. Importantly, the hippocampus is a very sensitive uh, structure to stress. Uh, it often shrinks faster or is damaged sooner than other parts of the brain uh, when we undergo cr uh, chronic stress such as that experienced during a pandemic. Uh, but there is good news. There are things that we can do such as lifestyle changes that can strengthen the hippocampus by stimulating neurogenesis and preventing uh, atrophy. So physical ac activity or exercise is a great example. There's a lot of research showing that it increases the size of the hippocampus and uh, it, it helps develop new neurons as well as increase and enhance the connections between them. And it does this by promoting a protein in the brain called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. So a rather large name, but what it basically is, is like a fertilizer for the brain. Uh, and it helps maintain uh, neurons and also to grow new, uh, new uh, brain cells. We do know that low levels of BDNF have been reported and found in people with mental illnesses such as depression. So uh, by d increasing BDNF levels, physical activity or exercise improves brain function it improves mood and general well-being. So in other words, regular exercise can uh, literally reprogram the brain for the better. So now to tell you about some of the research that we're currently doing uh, at the Thompson Institute. Uh, and Jim mentioned this one, uh, the Longitudinal Adolescent Brain Study, which is the study I lead. It commenced in July 2018. <clears throat> and as Jim mentioned, it's a world first study whereby adolescents uh, come in and do interviews and cognitive assessments, as well as an MRI brain scan every four months for five years. Uh, so one of the main goals of the study of labs is to identify brain and behavior patterns that may help us understand how mental disorders emerge in adolescents. So during the COVID restrictions, we continued remote assessments via Zoom. Uh, and we also added some specific uh, questions about worry associated with COVID. So we're now in this very unique position of being able to understand whether there are brain changes in adolescents that may be specific to their experience of a pandemic. Oh, sorry, I just uh, forgot to click that extra thing there, but we've had 72 young people in the study and overall uh, a total of 280 assessments and brain scans. So in this uh, uh, publication here, this is a labs publication from last year, from 2019. 
we found a significant association between the size of the hippocampus and psychological distress in early adolescence. So that is those with smaller hippocampus had increased levels of uh, distress. So what we wanna do next is now examine what happens after COVID. So that is do uh, levels of worry associated with COVID. Uh, what happens with those levels of worry associated, uh, associated with COVID as well as uh, what uh, happens as le uh, with levels of physical activity change during this period and does that play a role? Now this is an important uh, thing to do because it may provide us with clues about the early warning signs of which adolescents may be at increased risk and also what type of things can be done to improve their outcomes. So finally, uh, in a very uh, COVID specific labs paper, this one's currently under review at a journal, we found that sleep quality uh, had become worse during COVID and those that uh, had difficulty falling asleep, as well as having a specific brain marker prior, prior to, previous to COVID restrictions, they actually reported higher levels of worry associated with COVID. So in other words, uh, this was seen as having uh, brain and behavior measures that could provide us with some early warning signs of when there may be greater impact uh, when uh, experiencing future stressful situations. So there's a lot more work to be done in this area and we'll certainly be telling you more about it as it progresses. So my final slide now, uh, and I'd like to tell you about a new clinical program we have now available at the Thompson Institute. It's called uh, Emerald uh, and it is an online telehealth based program developed and delivered by Thompson Institute experts. Now, Emerald is an evidence-based uh, program for those who have recently noticed that their mental well-being could benefit from some proactive uh, attention. Uh, it involves self-guided teaching modules that help explain mental health strategies and why they are effective. Uh, modules in this program include uh, those around diet, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, uh, and social connectedness or lifestyle factors. And furthermore, uh, the program, uh, those who use the, or access the program can get up to four telehealth appointments with either a dietitian, psychologist, or exercise physiologist, depending on the goals that they set. And best of all, it's free. Uh, and the aims of this program is to help people modify lifestyle factors in order to improve their mental health and wellbeing. So if you're interested in uh, knowing more about this, please check out the uh, Thompson uh, Institute webpage and uh, uh, have a look under clinical services. I think I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll leave it there and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I can't see myself, so I'm assuming I'm, I'm up there and people can hear me. Uh, perhaps you can stop sharing your screen, Dan, that might help, I think. Uh, yep, great. Can I ask, can I invite all the panel, uh, all the speakers from tonight, uh, to, um, uh, to start uh, their video feed again. And we've got a little bit of time, we've got about 15 minutes or so, um, and we've got just enough time for some questions. So if anyone has got questions in the audience, please do keep them uh, coming through and we'll try and get through as many of these as possible. I've got a question here. The first question I've got actually is for Dan Herman. So Dan, can I get you to answer this one? Um, does exercise have the same positive effect if the participant doesn't enjoy it? I.e., is the benefit proportional to the enjoyment of the chosen activity? And maybe Dan Wadsworth uh, can chime in on this as well. Yeah, I think it's the wrong Dan, uh, but I'll have this crack at it and then get my fellow Dan to help out. Uh, I guess, you know, enjoyment is all about how often you do it. And in so many thing, uh, ways, in so many um, uh, uh, aspects, um, brain function is very much um, enhanced by the number of times we do things. Um, and physical health or uh, um, exercise is no different. Um, there's a bit of a saying in neuroscience, neurons that wire together fire together. So what that means is, and Jim's laughing at this, so I'd like Jim to add to this, but it's when we do things over and over, they, they, um, they really uh, crystallize, they, uh, you know, our, our networks consolidate and our brain learns and, and, and improves. So uh, I guess I'm trying to answer the question by saying, if you do exercise enough, 
uh, it will have uh, benefit. But, you know, I guess you need motivation, you need enjoyment to be able to do it enough. Um, but there are many instances of where we need to do things over and over for them to be set and to change the brain in a positive way. Um, Dan, help us out about uh, motivation and enjoyment around exercise. Obviously, enjoying exercise is important. Yeah, I think you're quite right, actually, Dan. Um, if you don't have that pleasure that you get from the exercise, it's a lot harder to literally get your butt off the sofa and you know, lace up your shoes and go out there and go for a run or whatever it may be. Um, it doesn't mean you can't get some benefits from it, but yeah, I, I think that potentially if you're seeing it as a negative thing, then maybe the benefits aren't going to be quite as much as they could be if it's something that you really are enjoying. And to touch on something that Rachel said, where she hinted that what is a stressor for someone, someone else will love. You know, it's the old saying, isn't it? One person's pleasure, poison is another person's pleasure. And if you ask me to go out and run a marathon, I would not look forward to doing that. But my neighbor goes off and runs um, 30K for fun. Um, and I'd certainly find that hard to do. And I think that that would be the big thing for me, the motivation and the enjoyment factor and how that feeds into your overall well-being. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, the two Dan's in combination. Um, Rachel, I've got a question for you. Can I just throw this one at you? Uh, Rachel, what are the benefits that you think, and the drawbacks indeed, of using social media during stressful times? And what strategies can we use to manage the drawbacks? Yeah, look, um, I must admit, I, I do a bit of social media research and, and not a lot of what I found has been positive, let, let's put it that way. But we are in very odd times. And so that, that's the difference. You know, for, for many people, social media um, platforms have really been the only point of connection for others. So, so for that, it's very helpful. And, and it feeds into that help seeking that I, I uh, you know, I mentioned in terms of don't go this alone. If, if you're, you're trying to find ways to solve problems, you're trying to find ways to you know, manage the stresses, help seeking is very important. And obviously if, if social media is all you've got or a digital platform is all you've got, that's great. Um, however, probably in general, um, social media and, and social media involvement, I think the bulk of the research, particularly some of the stuff coming out of the UK, which is I, I think very high quality, is pointing to, you know, almost an addictive kind of cycle with social media and, and, and particularly young people really over relying on, you know, likes and feedback and, and that kind of thing. And we, we've got a paper under review at the moment looking at the effect of, um, of likes. Uh, and a lot of it was actually quite negative. So I think we, it, it's, it's that old sort of thing, moderation, balance, understand we are in a pandemic, understand that for some people, social media is all they've got. And in that case, fine, it's a substitute. But overall, it's probably a poor substitute. So where possible, um, do the right thing. And Jim, if I may, I will actually just for that previous question about do you have to enjoy something, just from a psychological point of view, there's a theory called behaviour activation theory, and it's basically fake it till you make it. And what, what, people, what people like to believe is that they do something because they enjoy it. Actually, funnily enough, if you do something often enough, you can start to form a habit and you can start to enjoy it. And it's so it, it doesn't always work. I'm, I'm not going to say it's a panacea, but it's just an interesting finding that we see in psychology that sometimes when we say to people, listen, if you're feeling down and you're feeling depressed, you don't want to socialise, you don't want to do anything too bad, so sad, go out and do it anyway. I mean, it sounds all very sort of harsh. Um, however, what we find is that as people get into that and they start to exercise, they start to socialise, they start to do those things, they genuinely do feel better. So you know, even if you're not enjoying it, sometimes that behavior activation can kick in. And what it's saying is the behavior activates the brain patterns that actually make a difference. And I, I think, you know, some of the, the research that we've seen from the Dan's here tonight uh, really demonstrates that that terribly important activation of physical activity and that it just has flow on effects that are very positive in the long run. And people feel that and therefore they feel better. No doubt about it. I, I think the person who discovers the, 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 the biological underpinnings that change uh, associated with exercise will win a Nobel Prize because it's got such wide, uh, you know, widespread implications for our biology and for us as people. But we really just don't know how it works. We just do it because it does work. 
but knowing how it works would be uh, an incredible um, uh, uh, advance in our understanding. Uh, Rach, can I just throw this one at you? Uh, I've just got another question that's come through and it's a very interesting one. Can I just uh, ask you, the, 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 um, the panel, uh, the audience member asks, are young people spending more time online during COVID and do you think it amplifies negative impacts for them? Now, certainly, I know my nine-year-old, when we were in lockdown, she probably had spent more time on uh, online. Now, obviously not on social media, but I'd be interested in your, uh, your views on this one. Look, guilty as charged. Um, I've got a two-year-old and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for nature play. What did my two-year-old do a lot more of? <laughs> Unfortunately, screen time. I mean, you know, it, you know, particularly when the playgrounds were locked down. Uh, my, myself and a, a neuroscience colleague from USC, we've both got two. It was a nightmare. Um, you know, when those playgrounds were locked down, it was it was very very difficult. Then, you know, so again, we're we're seeing a lot of really altered behaviours during COVID that that people wouldn't normally resort to. But it's all we've got, you know. It's it's all we've got for for a bit of peace and quiet. Um, look, I'm I, I'm not across the research on whether um, people have spent more time online. I think you would have to be in a coma to think that they weren't. <laughs> I mean, surely, surely common sense tells you that a lot more people are spending a lot more time on social media and just online and digitally and all that sort of stuff, particularly if they're actually pretty much banned from leaving their house, unless they're living on lovely acreage, you know, what else are they going to do? Um, let's be honest about that. I, I think this will be a marvellous social experiment and I think it will be very interesting to see, and I, I know there are people like, you know, the Dan's doing all this, this fa fabulous research actually tracking this and fabulous for Daniel Herman's there to have caught those longitudinal, I mean, for those of us who understand longitudinal research and you've sort of caught them in a, in a nasty pandemic to, to actually see the brain impact of that, just fascinating. Um, time will tell whether this ends up being a blip on the radar, let's hope. I mean, kids are resilient, kids do adapt. If we get a vaccine and, and things start to move back more to normal, hopefully they will adapt and they'll adapt back to, to better processes. But yeah, I, I can't see, you know, all of that extra screen time and, and digital in, impact being a positive, let's put it that way. Hopefully it's temporary. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, I mean, my own impressions are that, um, you know, we, we talk about coping mechanisms and uh, if you, you'd, you'd like to think that um, if it did help them in some way, with coping with the situation that there are some benefits, you know, no one is advocating hours and hours of screen time, but you can almost understand that some screen time, even though it was more than what would normally be the case, uh, might also be beneficial in the right circumstances as well. Um, Look, absolutely. And, and I'm really, so I'm just really excited about the, the research. I did not know what um, Dan, the Daniels, sorry. <laughs> I can't help but call you that. We're going to present. I honestly didn't. And I just think it's fascinating because I think what you're seeing there, so we can't solve COVID. We can't. We, we, like, we're in lockdowns. We, 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 you know, we just, there's, there's not a lot that we can, so there's, so there's not a lot of problem solving that can happen. So it's really fascinating from, from these two researchers that the people who did use physical activity as their coping mechanism, and they, they, they had to resort to an emotion coping mechanism, we all did, let's be honest, but they're the ones that are really coming up trumps and showing great results. And I just think that's fascinating because it's, it's amplifying that effect almost of that physical activity. I mean, it's always there anyway, but it's like when the chips are down, you've got nothing you can do, please, please exercise. That's, that's if, if you have to resort to an emotion focused um, coping strategy, that's clearly the one that's getting the benefit for you. Whereas the others are really quite negative in terms of their, their outcomes. Uh, I'll just jump in there just quickly, Jim. Sorry. So one of the papers I was reading recently about this in the context of young people and physical activity and mental health and wellbeing and digital tools or screens is that that is probably one of the best strategies for them when it comes to physical activity. So mm -hmm. digital based active games uh, is seen as a very important strategy for young people. Um, games that are pro-social that in, in, you know, even encourage competition or social interaction, uh, you know, like the, um, you know, those games where you interact with a screen, um, but you're doing uh, physical activity, some kind of sport. So 
we, we should, um, th there are many strengths of screens. There are very advanced, there are many advantages of digital tools and, and some members of the population, especially young people can greatly benefit from them. So that's really how we use them. That's, that's important. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, I've got a couple of fascinating questions that have come through for, for Daniel, the other Daniel, Daniel Wadsworth. Dan, can I get you to uh, answer this question? And the question is from uh, one of the uh, attendees and they say, they ask, does pre-existing physical disability complicate results for your studies into the benefits of physical activity or are the potential participants excluded if that's the case for them? Yeah, this is actually a really good question, Jim, because we did have that as one of our questions in our survey. Do you have any other comorbidities? Because that obviously may restrict what activity you can do. So that in turn could impact on how reactive you are to situations like the lockdown. And what we actually saw is that people who had comorbidities um, were more likely to make a change, either in the positive or the negative. We saw, again, that sort of equal either way, but who were the ones who perhaps were responding or perhaps saw a negative effect on it. So yeah, it certainly can make, play a difference, but it was an a, element that we did include in our study. I should as well also caveat Jim, that our study is under review at the moment, so we're not quite at the publishing, published stage yet. We actually finally got comments back from our reviewers um, yesterday. Excellent. Can, can I, um, th there's another question, it's a burning question that I have, and I, I, and I think that uh, half the uh, attendees have probably got this as well. What's the best type of exercise for our own mental health? For example, is yoga better, or is high intensity interval type exercises better? Do we know? This is a lovely question, isn't it? Again, the first thing I would probably do is, you know, think back to the old um, poison and pleasure thing. But um, from a perspective, we can see the benefits of yoga bring, bring in additional things along the whole mindfulness approach. And I'm sure Rachel could talk to us for hours about the benefits of mindfulness and our mental health. Um, so certainly yoga can bring added benefits to the physical activity side of things and the exercise. But a lot of the aerobic activity that gets you going outside and spending time in the fresh air and in the sunlight can also have very similar impacts on lifting your mood. Um, equally, not something that we were really able to do during COVID, but for a lot of people, one of the most important benefits mentally that they get out of exercise is that social connectedness. You know, feeling like you're part of a team and going along on a, a Saturday afternoon or whenever it is to play soccer with your, with your teammates and feel that camaraderie that's what gives them the real mental boost that comes with it so it's actually something that um, again potentially is down to the individual and looking at the overall holistic package I don't know if Rachel or Dan have anything that they would like to add on that. Well before Dan and Rachel uh, jump in um, uh, I, I want to get this last question in because I'm, I'm looking that we are right on time here and uh, I'm getting a wind up signal here. But Dan, again, just like uh, uh, Dan number one, you'll be Dan number two. Dan number one's um, response with regards to exercise is a burning question, but so is sleep. What role does sleep have in terms of our mental health and the benefits, especially during uh, stressful times? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, yeah, I love sleep. Uh, I'm not the best at it, but uh, when I sleep well, it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> it's so important. Um, I, you know, I touched on a study that we've, the, the one specific COVID study we've done, and it is um, by one of our PhD students, another Dan, Dan Jameson, uh, <laughs> who's doing a lot of work on, there's a lot of Dans on, on the coast. Uh, <laughs> looking at sleep. Sleep's super important, um, but it, it must be, I think it's important to say sleep wake, you know, the sleep wake cycle. So what you're doing when you're awake uh, and active for that 15, 16 hours uh, during the day is critically important to how well you sleep for eight or nine hours a night. Um, so that's very important. Um, and also to be habitual as best you can, you know, if your job allows that, of course. But um, so habitual sleep time, the time you go to sleep, the time you wake up, if it can be set, um, then that, you know, that's basically your circadian rhythms. It aligns you with the sun, it aligns you with your, your gut when you eat, all those sorts of things. So 
being uh, having a habit in terms of sleep, being active when you're awake, they're, they're super important for brain health. And, and what we know and very recently, actually, wouldn't if we got time, Jim might elaborate on this, but we, there's recently been, it's pretty recent actually in, in neuroscience, the discovery of uh, is it the glymphatic system. Um, basically, sleep is an opportunity for our brains to detox. Um, so we know that when we sleep, um, all the metabolic byproducts of the busyness of your brain during the day uh, are cleaned up. Um, so uh, there's a lot of research now looking at uh, how sleep is important in detoxifying your brain. Um, so we need rest. We need to be asleep. Um, we need to have fixed sleep-wake cycles. So it's interesting we focused on physical activity or exercise today, but you know, they go hand in hand and then there's food. So they're all tied in with the circadian rhythms. I could talk about that stuff for hours, but I might leave it there. Thanks, Dan. Um, we're, we're right on time. Um, I, I won't go into too much or any detail with regards to what you mentioned, but just to add to what you said, the glymphatic system is a new system in the brain that people have just recently discovered. And it is absolutely vital for keeping us mentally well. And um, sleep is when it's activated and where uh, metabolic waste products are actually eliminated from the brain. At the Thompson Institute, we're doing a lot of work uh, in that with some of our brain imaging. And perhaps sometime in the future, we might be able to uh, present on that. But on that point, can I just say, thank you very much to our uh, speakers, Dan, Dan and Rachel. It's been fascinating. It's been lovely to meet uh, most, uh, some of you, because I haven't met you uh, previously. I'd also like to thank our attendees today. Thank you very much. This is the first of many research unmasked. We hope that you found this stimulating. Thank you very much for your questions. And at this particular point, what we might do, if there are additional questions that we haven't got to, we'll collate them and we'll find a way that we can get those out to all attendees. And at this particular point, what I might do is um, bid you all a uh, good night. And I hope that you've had um, a good evening with us tonight. Thanks everyone. Good night.